Okay, well, hello everyone. Let's get started with this fourth webinar of the World Duchenne Organization. Hi everyone, my name is Suzanne, and together with Nicoletta and Elizabeth, we will facilitate these questions to experts regarding the COVID-19 pandemic for the Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy community. And this time we're touching base on mental health and how to manage stress and anxiety for both patients and their families. So more about that in a minute. First, I'd like to explain the mechanics of this webinar platform. So you have the slides in front of you and you will be muted during the full webinar. So really your keyboard is your voice. So if you'd like to ask uh, a question or wish to comment on the speaker during the webinar, you can use it uh, by clicking on this comment box. So it's that little speak bubble you see in the top right corner. Uh, so from these questions, the discussion later on will be moderated. So use this comment box almost like as a digital chat room. So we have some input during these discussion. So here you can see the agenda of today. We start with a small recap of topics we have discussed during the previous webinars. And then Nicoletta, our community manager, will share what these questions and concerns were that rose from the community regarding social issues. And after that, we invite Dr. Jos Hendriksen, who works as a clinical neuropsychologist at Kempenhagen, which is a center of expertise for neurological learning and developmental disorders in the Netherlands, to give a small lecture about stress and anxieties and worries and what you can do to take care of yourself and your little one. And this will be followed by a discussion that is moderated by Elizabeth Frome, who's the, well, the chair of the World Shed Organization, and Dr. Molly Colvin will join us as well. And she's a clinical neuropsychologist and an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. So, so far, we had the pleasure of inviting these seven brilliant minds to pick their brains on COVID issues related to Duchenne and Becker. And I want to walk you through the topics that we discussed during these previous webinars. So in the first webinar, we invited Professor Muntoni, Professor Mercuri, Professor Finder and Professor Humans to explain what the risks are for people affected by Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy when they become infected. And we also asked them to explain the health risks and the risks of complication in case of a possible infection. And in the second webinar, we also discuss what to do uh, regarding medications such as steroids and use of supplements to boost your immunity for COVID-19 times, together with Dr. Wong and Professor De Luca. And in our last webinar last week, Professor Verschuren explained how families, clinicians and hospitals can prepare for a possible DMD or BMD patient infected with COVID-19. So these were briefly the topics of our previous webinars. Um, the recordings and reports are available on our website if you wish to take a look at it later on. Uh, you can always go to worldduchenne.org or go to our YouTube channel, which is World Duchenne Organization. And next to these webinars, we also have a live feed on our website that we update daily with news on the coronavirus that is related to Duchenne and Becker. So that was my introduction and recap. Uh, now I'd like to introduce to you the next speaker, which you're probably familiar with. Her name is Nicoletta, and she's the community coordinator of the World Duchenne Organization. So right now she will provide an update on what kind of social issues she has and sees emerging from the global Duchenne and Becker community. Thank you, Susiane. Hello, everyone. So uh, today, as Susiane has told you, we will speak about social issues about this COVID emergency. And uh, we have collected uh, during these weeks uh, some input coming from our uh, global family. So while we are speaking, we speak about the international community. We have divided into stages, so childhood, childhood and adolescence. So the parents' perspective. They said that they are being stressed about the possibility that the COVID-19 could affect the child or other members of the family. We have more activities to be carried out from caregivers. So if we just consider homeschoolings or physical therapy, 
they have to manage questions and the time of their children. They have to manage the stress of the children obliged to stay at home. And they are stressed about the health condition of the children due to some clinical, clinical actions postponed, because as you know, in many countries, some clinical actions are postponed at the moment. And they are stressed about the uncertainty of this time and the loss of the daily routine for their caregivers. So no time, no space for them. Then we have the boys' perspective. So we have the redefinition of the daily routine, fear about the situation, stress for staying always at home, and no physical interaction with the external world and friends. So this means for many of them, isolation. Going to the adults, we have the parents' perspective. Uh, they are similar to the parents, of course, of uh, many of our children. So we have some common points because, of course, they are stressed about the possibility that the COVID-19 could affect the young adults or other members. And, uh, of course, even in this case, they have more activities to be carried out from them. They are stressed about the health condition, even because when, you know, when we, you know, we know that uh, when you are a young adult, uh, the condition is severe and they are stressed about this, the uncertainty again. Speaking about the young adult and the adult's perspective, Mm, there is a, a new in, in situation, so they have uh, fear about the situation, but for the health of the caregivers, so they are not so much focused on themselves, but for mm, they are more focused on caregivers. Concern about the stress of the caregivers, so in this sense, uh, nervous anger, more isolation for many of them, but at the same time, we have a great resilience and a great sense of responsibility because many of them in this moment are sharing their experiences and would love that starting from this experience, um, everyone can understand the, you know, the meaning of living in a really difficult situation, the, the meaning of living with a disease and all the aspects that are connected to it. And we are able to share with you three stories that you can easily find on the mentioned websites. So on World Ocean Organization, we have the story of a boy uh, affected by COVID in Belgium. On socialduchenne.org, the story of Simone, an Italian boy speaking about COVID-19 and respiratory issues. And then the DMD Pathfinders. Uh, there is a really important uh, experience by John SD. Everything will be available on these websites. We collected some specific questions from the community to our experts. So, questions from our parents. How to find time for ourselves within the house? What can I do for my son to avoid isolation? How to speak with my little son about COVID-19? How to manage anxiety? How to create a new routine? Questions from our young adults. How, as a DMD young adult, can I control the anxiety of my parents? How can I control nervous anger? So in this moment, I give the microphone to Elizabeth Vroom to introduce this new topic. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta. And thank you, the two experts who are there today. Yes, we, we've seen in our uh, community uh, anxiety uh, about different subjects and different, uh, at different moments. It was kind of a wave. First, we had the anxiety about uh, are Duchenne boys and men more at, at risk to be affected? Uh, and then what is the risk when they get infected? Do they have a more severe cause of the disease, what will happen. Thank God we have seen so far that the Duchenne boys men did quite well when they, uh, infected. Then there were questions about and stress about what to do with medication, with steroids, ACE inhibitors, other medicines that can give a boost to the immune system, and also about what can we do if we have to go to a hospital. Will hospitals accept us? What if there's like triage and there's no IC beds or critical care beds for us and so on. So uh, we go up and down in our uh, anxiety and uh, stress. 
for the this uh, webinar, it's the same as for the ones before. We have experts in this webinar, but nobody is an expert on Duchenne and Corona, as this is something really new to us. And in every country, uh, the rules, but also the situation might be different. So here then are the uh, two speakers, Dr. Jos Hendricks and Dr. Molly Colvin, both very much involved in the Duchenne community since a long time. And uh, I would like to give the word to uh, Dr. Hendricks first. Yes, uh, thank you, Elizabeth Fromm. Thank you for, uh, for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I want to give <clears throat> some general rules about, uh, about psychological issues. And a straight and simple answer is, uh, is not possible on how to deal with the anxiety, um, as everyone is in a different situation. But we can give some general principles and some theoretical background so that you understand what it is about. Uh, during this presentation, Dr. Molly Colvin will be my counterpart, and she will take over now and then and rephrase and ask questions so that there will be some interaction and some, some discussion on my presentation. In this way, we will hopefully uh, present something interactive to you. So the first thing I want to uh, go on let's see there's the next slide is to, to to tell a little bit about about what is stress stress there is a simple answer to it it's a normal reaction to an abnormal situation and that's important to keep in mind we are now in an abnormal situation and the stress we have is normal and later on we will discuss that you should acknowledge the normality of this reaction so stress is a useful and a healthy and a quick response and it may have different manifestation it is the body which is made which is prepared for a reaction and the manifestations may be on the physical uh, level or on the cognitive part uh, influencing your concentration or your memory or it may have influence on your emotions or on the behavior it may result in anger, it may result in depression, but it may also result in stomach ache. And it depends on the person's sensitivity, how you react. So some people are sensitive with their stomach and have stomach ache, and other people have sensitivity for headache. And we should be aware of that. Um, the next slide is about how this develops. Stress is an, a reaction which develops over time. And we are now in a, a corona crisis and we are at some part uh, of some, um, some point of, of time. And this is how it is described, how the reactions are. There is initially an, an alarm reaction and then there is a phase of resistance. And this may result when it takes longer, it may result in an exhaustion phase. And actually, Dr. Colvin, Molly, we discussed about this. Do you have any comments on this slide? Yes, I think what we're recognizing is that the stress that we're under right now is, uh, is uh, we don't know how long it will take. Um, and when stress goes on without a clear endpoint, we do have this physiological and cognitive response that is captured in this curve where there's resistance and then it can lead to exhaustion. Okay, thank you. So later on, maybe we have some discussion about this time, time scheme which we have. The next slide is about uh, the typical normal reactions. Actually, one can distinguish two ways of reacting to stress. Um, it may be as a flight or it may be as a fight reaction. And uh, you need both reactions. You need to use both reactions depending on the stage of stress in which you are. And one of the most uh, ideas of this is that given the current situation of Corona, it may be adequate to first flight from the threat and after a while start fighting the threat so that you manage to uh, have your emotions in control 
And when they are in control, you can start to react and act on it. I don't know, Molly, if you have any comments on this. I think you know, when you go to the, the next slide, when you start to talk about how um, it evolves over time, you know, as we live with chronic stress, it may actually be hard to recognize whether you're in that fight or flight state. Your body adjusts over time. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, so if you can talk about this curve that you're showing here and how it evolves over time so that we're not even aware of the fact that we're in a state of chronic stress and the toll that it takes on our bodies and our minds. Yes, so actually that is one of the main things which is in, in this slide is that chronic stress may be difficult to observe and it may be a silent threat. So it may be camouflaged and it may be difficult to observe it in yourself. And you may, uh, it may look as if you get uh, uh, habituated to it, but actually it may be uh, present. So the warning is that you should take care of chronic stress and maybe that you need others to help you look at yourself, whether you are in a constant stress and in a constant mode of threat. So to bring you to the next slide, and the next slide is about the first message we want to make. In essence, we should realize that stress is a normal and healthy reaction to a threat, and that it is important to acknowledge your thoughts and your worries and your uncertainties about the stress. Any comments on this, Molly? I think this is going to be a really important part for our community as we go forward, especially not knowing how long this will go. Yes. Okay, thank you. So what can you do about it? The first and most important thing is to take care of yourself. And you should never forget that that's, that is actually very important. And it, it's called the oxygen mask rule. Whenever you are in an airplane, there is a, a, a stewardess saying that should the cabin lose pressure, oxygen masks will drop from the overhead area and you are urged to place the mask over your own mouth and nose before assisting others. Even put them on your own nose and mouth before helping your child. And this is very, very important message. So if we don't take care of ourselves, we very likely are not able to help others. And this is very important to try to see how this can help you. So this, these are then the things which you can read in the literature, in the books about how to manage stress, to take care of yourself and to stay in balance and to be kind to yourself, to connect with your physical body which is called mindfulness. Be mindful of what was happening. Sit and look around and be aware of what is happening and acknowledge what is happening and engage in what you are doing and take a broad pause and take a breath. So relaxing and turning off, having a book, doing your sports is important to stay in balance. And it's important to increase your resilience by regular things, doing healthy, uh, eating, sleeping enough, and breathing in and out and being mindfulness of this. Any comments on this for now, Molly? I think these are great suggestions. I think one of the things that I am hearing people struggle with is how we do this when there is just a constant stream of information. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how to do that, Jos. Yes, so you should take a pause and you should take uh, uh, time for yourself and there are some things which you should not do so when we go to the next uh, uh, slide it's about a brain pause it, it, it's that's the best name for calling it and it has to do with the multimedia hygiene which we should take care of in this time so uh, at these times we get continuous information on corona and our brains are overactive and becoming sensitive and we read a lot of news about corona and this can lead to panic attacks. So 
protect your mental health is very important by adjusting to multimedia hygiene. So limit the news and be careful of what you read and what you watch. Molly, do you have any? I think this is a great suggestion. If it's hard to turn it off, sometimes I think it's helpful to even schedule uh, media breaks. So knowing that you will check your media in the morning and then at night, but really sort of trying to then in between those checks to live your life as normally as possible. And to recognize as you are consuming information, if you start to have some of those signs of the fight or flight response, if you're listening to the news or you're reading something in the newspaper and your heart rate starts to go up or you notice your breathing becomes more shallow or your mind starts to speed up, those are all really good indicators that it's time to stop and take a break. Yes, thank you. So uh, the second message is take self-care and stay in balance and take a brain pulse and also allow your boy to take a brain pulse also take care of the multimedia hygiene for your boy who is also watching television reading papers and so on so what's next to get control uh, what is it about when we have stress it's about also our brain which is going on in the stresses and who starts to worry about all the things and that's called the worry chain so you have a uh, when you have a headache uh, you start thinking what if it is a coronavirus and then the chain may go on and you may say think about passing it to others or you may have other worries about the thing so worry feels like a change of thought like a chain of thoughts and of images and they may bother you it's called the worry chain where minor events may escalate and uh, spend a lot of our energy and that brings me to one other principle which may help you to control your stress levels and help your boy to control the stress level it has to do with uh, the circles of influence and this was described by Covey and he described the circle, uh, two circles of influence, the circle of control and the circle of uh, uncertainty. And when you worry, you should seek control over the things that you can influence and you should not bother too much and should not spend too much energy in the things you can't control. So to go to the next slide, when you say, uh, you see on the left side the things I cannot control and on the right side things you can control. So what you can't control is who gets ill and you can't control how long it will last. You can't control the distance that other people keep from you or whether you are allowed to go to work or to school. And on the other side, and that's more important to put energy in, is in what you can control. You can control whether you will be watching the news, whether you will be watch, washing your hands and how long you wash your hands, what things you do at home and whether you will help people and how you will help them. So the, the message to take is that what you could do is to make for yourself the circles of uncertainty and the circle of control where you can find out what am I in control of and where should I spend my energy. Molly, what about this? I think this is really important and I think we were talking earlier about some things that might help people feel like they're, they, they have agency over the things that they can control related to Duchenne and Becker might be making sure that you have medications or the contact information for your providers or a plan to be seen for virtual visits um, or even making decisions about which therapies and visits to keep at this point in time and which ones to postpone or convert to a virtual visit. Um, those are things that are under control 
things that are not under control or um, what's happening in hospitals right now. And so worrying about things that are not under control takes up really important resources and energy um, that we all need to manage the chronic stress response over time. Thank you. So stop wasting time on the things you can't control and focus on the thing you can control. And it helps if you think of your daily life and the things that happen to you in terms of uh, the circles of influence and to finding out what you are of in control for. Okay, so how can we give some psychological first aid? Because that's what we are a little bit talking about. And the World Health Organization has given some uh, uh, information about psychological first aid aid in the situation where we are and it is actually about two things it is about find support so to find some support uh, 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 energy and the other is to communicate and to inform others so support is for instance a body system uh, helping to register and to offer practical support and the communication is essentially because communication on your needs and worries helps also to find resources and to identify resources and these psychological first aids are one of the things that you can that you can do so the second fourth message we want to give is stay connected and communicate and that's important so besides the staying in control from the third message, we have the fourth message, stay connected and communicate. And that's important because we can have a, pl a platform of communication and to have body support and to have other mechanisms of finding help. That's something we should discuss on Molly. You have any comments? Yes, I think even at a practical level, um... You know, I think some of the things that have been done throughout the world and the community around scheduling time to check in with family and friends who are not in your house, whether that's by telephone or by um, web platforms like Zoom, to schedule time to connect to your extended support network is important during these periods of isolation to feel that you're still connected to the broader world and that your support network extends even beyond your home. Um, and I think during those visits, it's also um, key to try to focus on the things that bring you pleasure or that are enjoyable. So playing games or talking about um, movies or books that you've read, as opposed to talking about what's happening around COVID. Um, so talking about experiences and keeping it personal um, will help center in the here and the now, um, as opposed to sort of shifting you into that circle of things that you can't control. Yes, thank you. So they are in the circle of control, what you can do and where you can have control over. So let's go on a little bit more. Let's see. Yes, there it is. So how to help children? That's another issue which we want to discuss a little bit on. And again, the World Health Organization have, has given a, a leaflet uh, on helping children cope with the stress during the COVID outbreak. And if you want that information, you can find it on the website of the World Health Organization. But it is about a few things. It's about supportive listening to the concerns of your child which is very important active supportive listening but it's also about finding opportunities to play and to relax for your child to stay in balance with the things that happen and 
important also to keep communication with your child, with your boy. Even when you are separated, it's even more important to stay in contact uh, with your child. Another and fourth principle which is important is to keep regular routines and that's sometimes difficult but it's one of the things which is in your circle of control to find out regular routines and to uh, uh, stick to them very strongly and the other one is the clear information which you need to give also to your boy helping children making sense of what they see and what they hear any comments molly i i think your point about routines is a really good one um you know when you're at home all of the time it's easy to kind of let the schedule go and for things to one day to kind of go into the next and to um, not make a plan about how you're going to spend the time but even thinking about breaking the day into um, regular meal times and regular times for um, physical kind of activity or even taking a walk, if that's something you can still do in your community or going outside for fresh air um, or spending time together singing or playing games. If there are a few things that you have a, a sort of a regular time for, then it, it gives your child a sense that there, there is control in their environment. Um, and it also helps them to break the time down. One of the things we know about children is that they don't have the same sense of time that we do. So an hour can feel like a very long time where for many adults, it feels like nothing at all. So planning to have kind of a regular breaks during the day or chunks of time during the day that are allocated similarly over time will help a child feel like there is some routine and that things are manageable um, to them. Okay, thank you. So what, what, what you say is a very important thing is, is when you communicate with your child, you should realize that the child has a different perspective on uh, the corona and then we as adults have we as adults we have a perspective on the future and children are mainly concentrated on the here and now so those different perspectives you should take care of in communicating with your child but what else about that communicating so we should when we discuss with our child we should uh, uh, discuss on the facts and we should give it a name so the coronavirus fact, one of the facts is that Corona is Latin for crown. I didn't realize that actually until I read this children's book about it. It's about uh, giving it a name. It's a, uh, and you can discuss why it is a crown and then it becomes something which is uh, having a name and which becomes in a little bit in control because we know how we call it and how we came to the name of Gullicut and you can even have more uh, facts on it because uh, there aren't a lot of kids uh, having the virus and uh, if kids get it they tend to be very mild so that's another fact which is important to stress and another fact is and don't forget there are a lot of helpers out there who are working to protect you and it's not your job to worry about this actually this is a very interesting a very good comic exploring the new coronavirus i have put the 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 link uh, at this slide because it's very nice to read this about some of the facts and what you should do and what is in your circle of control again so any things you want to add molly I love this message for kids about giving the worry to their helpers um, and allowing them permission to hand the worry over to adults who care and love about them. Um, I think it's really important knowing that they, their circle of what they can control is even smaller than ours. And so just as we want to um, 
focus on the things that we have control over. We want our children to also be able to focus on the things that they have control over. Um, and so some of their worries are things that we as adults do have control over and should have responsibility for. So allowing them permission to hand over their worries, um, I think is a really powerful thing to say to many children. Exactly, that's, that's an important message to take. Um, when you talk uh, with your boy and listens, uh, that helps to cope. So uh, helping children making sense of what they have been seeing, what they have been hearing and experience is very important in uh, communicating with your boys. And that's actually listening carefully, active listening, listening to uh, what are the worries of your child. So if a child asks you what happens if I get it, you should not uh, give an answer to the fact, but you should try to listen and to hear his worries and allow your boy to fully answer the question and hear his worries. Huh? Because you can also say, you sound worried about this, what have you heard? And then you are listening and getting and communicating about the worries that bother him. Any things to add to this? I Molly? think the way you phrased the question is great. And it, it, it comes back to a point you made a minute ago about recognizing the difference in perspectives between um, parents and their children. And obviously this changes with different developmental stages so there's often a, a bigger gap between a parent and a child who is younger than a child who is older but regardless of their age starting with an assessment of their knowledge is often the best way to open a conversation like this because what you may be worried about could be very different than what your child is worried about um, and most of the time you will have the answers. So I think also feeling comfortable that you can either address their questions or if you can't, then you can model how you would find an answer or come to a solution together can feel like a way to bring yourself closer to your child um, while also having them with the sense that they can hand their worries over to you as we were just talking about and how important that is um in in fostering connection within the family but also sort of allowing your child to, to know what they are what they can and cannot control yes thank you okay so there's one more thing we want to say and that's when protecting your child from anxious feeling it's important not to promote the anxiousness uh, because that's a, a risk which may happen when you uh, when you are busy with anxiousness so it's important and that's in your circle of control to set limits and to be strict in some limits and clear so for instance with respect to hand washing it's advised to wash your hands but it should be limited to 20 seconds and not a second longer it also for social distancing is important but it's not allowed to go into self-isolation or to go further than the social distancing so set limits also in the social media which we discussed about and also in reassurance limit the reassurance the amount of reassurance that you give as a parent because when you give too much reassurance it may make your boy uh, more anxious. Anything on this now, Molly? I the point about reassurance is a good one. Um, often, what we find is that reassurance lowers the level of anxiety, but then it becomes a primary mechanism um, for dealing with anxiety in the future. So, in other words giving reassurance alleviates anxiety or reduces anxiety in the moment but if it's if it if it's something that the the person becomes dependent upon then they will continue to seek reassurance 
more and more often as time goes on. Um, and it's, it's best then to sort of teach how to tolerate the sense of distress that comes from being anxious um, and to sit with that in a, in a mindful way um, and then to sort of continually feed the reassurance behavior. Thank you very much, Molly. So this was our last slide in giving you uh, uh, some information on the stress and anxiety and how getting in control of these aspects. Thank you. Thank you so much, both speakers. I think this was amazing. And I must say that I think that not only the Duchenne community, but the whole world could really benefit from your advices, your discussions. I think this was really uh, an extraordinary way to explain how to handle stress and what stress means. Thank you so much. And, and, and really, I think you were so clear because there were only very few questions, but the, the one, uh, Beatrice, would you like to open your microphone and ask the question you sent us? Beatrice? Okay, if not, then I'll ask her question. Uh, Beatrice uh, from France asked, what would you recommend to trying to avoid to communicate parent stress to the Duchenne patients, especially when being all confined at home? Could you give some advices on that, Jos or Molly? I think this is an excellent question and it is very difficult um, to, I think what we're talking about, about managing stress is very difficult to do when everybody is confined at home all together. Um, and I think for parents, especially it's it, it, the worry that we're all experiencing right now seems like it's background noise. It's there all the time and it's exhausting to sort of have that kind of constant chatter in our minds about what's happening. Um, I think that the recognition of differences in perspective is important. Um, so to the extent that is possible, recognizing that the kinds of things that may be worrying you and, the, and, and or may not be the kinds of things that are worrying the child. So opening the conversation by assessing a child's knowledge is always gonna be important. But I also think being mindful about, um, you know, making, only, only talking about it a few times a day if you need to, but also making the space for self-care. Um, as you was talking about at the beginning about putting on your own oxygen mask and making time during the day, just as you would for togetherness and for communication, for there to be self-care and points where you can ideally sort of disengage, if even for a few minutes, to take care of your own, um, your own thoughts and needs. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's it's about checking in with yourself and uh, taking care of the of 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 the thing that's happened. If you if you if you uh, were if you think of being confined, you could also say we are together now and we can make and then find out what you are in control, and not try to avoid, but try to uh, communicate in an open way, but set limits also in what you do thank you thank you so much and then there was Anna quite another question and a compliment the compliment is this was amazingly useful so uh thank you again from the audience and a question from Susie Ann uh, she got in was what can you do or say when you observe stress behavior in other parents Yes, I think that it is, if you observe that that was one of the slides which we showed in the beginning, it's it's important that people can't watch themselves how they react to situations. Uh, so it's important that you, uh, that you are a, a mirror to other people and help them to get in touch with their stress. And when they get in touch with the stress, they get into control with their stress. So information processing being in contact with others finding support peer support uh, is very important i also think you know it, uh, a good way to open those conversations is to even just say what you notice so to use i statements and say 
mm -hmm. uh, or just general observations to say it seems as though um, you might be really worried about things. Am I right? Or um, it seems that you might be um, focusing on the, the possible negative outcomes and then that must be really challenging. So to sort of be reflective in an empathic way and to sort of point it out that you observe it. And then it's easier, I think, to shift the conversation. Um, I think sometimes if it's said in a different way, we say, oh, you just seem really stressed and worried all the time, that can push people away and sort of uh, and increase the, their isolation and reduce the likelihood that you're able to give mutual support. But if you start the conversation with an observation of you seem really worried about that, and if the answer then is yes, then well, can I help you sort of reduce the worries or manage the stress, um, or what can I do to help you? Is a is a way of starting to move the conversation so you can be supportive and and get to a place where you're then not talking about Corona or the um, stresses that are going on, and maybe talking about mutual interests instead. Thank you so much. And then there's another question which might have some overlap with what you already told, but what are methods to recommend to break a negative thought loop? I would say the first is recognizing that you're in one. Um, <laughs> and that can be a challenge in and of itself. You know, as we were talking about at the beginning, when your body and your mind shift into chronic stress, it can be silent. It can happen in a way that is almost imperceptible so that the worry thoughts that would have stood out to you as being abnormal a few weeks ago suddenly become partly normal. Um, and, and that is a natural response even to changes in the circumstances that we're in. Um, so I think this is where, you know, if you have those sort of self-care breaks, that they're really check-ins with yourself about, how, what am I thinking about right now? How is my body feeling? Um, do I need to spend a few moments here to take a breath or to think about something different or um, to reach out to a friend? Um, but I think the first, it, it, the first step and, the, and sometimes the hardest is recognizing that you're in one and then it's going to feel like you want to stay in it to solve the problem, but in fact, we can't solve any of the problems. And so then forcing yourself to shift and to do something different um, is important. And to the extent that you sort of know what those activities might be. Um, so this is where I think it's helpful to think about, you know, if you have a book that you want to read or a movie that you want to watch or, you know, a couple of friends who you can check in with, um, so that in those moments when you do recognize you're in one of those thought patterns, you also have at your fingertips a few things that you know you can do to get yourself out of that pattern. Yes, the word self-care break is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the word I want to stress. You should take several times a day deliberately uh, and uh, force yourself to take some self-care breaks. I think it's especially important if you're caregiving for some for Duchenne, for someone with Duchenne or with Becker. I mean, the we know that um, you know, so coping with a chronic medical illness and parenting a child with a chronic medical illness is is hard, even under the best of circumstances. Um, but it's even harder under emergency situations like this. And so making sure that there is time for self-care um, is something that will really help as we all sort of move forward through this situation. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much again. I think with this, we can go to the uh, next uh, uh, slide. Can you do that, Suzanne? So um, then what we, what we always do is kind of think with you and what we can do for you and maybe also what you can do for your community. And uh, uh, as you already heard today, um, it's important to listen and acknowledge people's concern and worries and plan the opportunities to play and relax. Tell them that they should try to do this. 
provide as an organization communication between peers, but also provide opportunities to chat with other parents, stay in contact, uh, distance, not disconnect, and translate and share webinars, but also kind of when we look at the webinars, help parents to be prepared, kind of like last week, we discussed having things in place and knowing which hospitals to go and so on. The more you are in, in, informed, the better, it, the, the better it is, and it gives really peace of mind to reach that stage. Um, share best examples with the global community. We really would encourage you to put on the inner Facebook group where we all are as a member organization. If you have some good examples, what you did as patient organization to reduce stress and anxiety, uh, please place it there so we can learn from each other. And then what can we do for you? Well, we can, uh, th this recording will be uh, available soon, very likely already tonight. Uh, we will play, you can look at the WDO live feed uh, where we will update all new information. Um, we, as we have been doing, and we will continue to do so. So again, there's a source of information which might help. Um, you can uh, follow, there will be a follow-up uh, webinars. And this time we will skip one week because of Easter and also to give you the time to inform us what you would love to see as a web uh, subject for the next webinar, the webinar, which will be in two weeks. Please send us an email or another message just to let us know what are the subjects to address and we can again ask the questions to the experts as we've been doing so far and we can support you really everyone uh, where we can so don't hesitate uh, to ask questions uh, uh, to us then last but not least i would say like the famous like uh, stay calm and move on i really hope this webinar helped everybody to kind of uh, take time for themselves, relax a bit and go on. We all need you, you know, we're all needed in this community. So take care of yourself, take care of your children and your family. But also thank you so much, so much to the two speakers of today. It's really invaluable what you have been uh, presenting to us so we can really work with this. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you everybody who uh, dialed in and then um, see you in two weeks. And then I please want to give the microphone to Nicoletta because she wants to provide an update as well. Nico? Yes, uh, so thank you again for joining today. We just wanted to tell you that uh, as uh, Jos said and Molly said, communication is very important and community are very important. So uh, please continue communicating within ourselves and share the Home for Duchenne campaign as you are doing because, you know, we can be stronger together. So thank you all. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to the end of the webinar. I would like to thank everybody for joining. I would wish everybody a very happy Easter. Uh, please let us know whether you have any questions or subjects or topics we'd like to discuss during next webinar. And uh, stay safe, stay home, and hope to speak to you soon.